Thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a clinical talk, and I hope I'll keep you awake for the next half hour and, uh, and, and that it will be sensible in a couple of minutes. It, Tuesday morning is, is our main antiphospholipid morning at our hospital. What we did in the lupus center was um, design the week so that we'd try and see different diseases in every day. So Monday was lupus pregnancy, which is epidemic now. Um, we loop Tuesday's antiphospholipid, renal lupus on a Wednesday, and so on. And what I'm going to do is present a cover of what you've been talking about, but in clinical terms, just to end the day. So first of all, I'd like to just recap on this 30th anniversary, really. What have we what have we learned about the antiphospholipid syndrome? Uh, we've learned a, quite a lot, but I'll briefly review it with three headings. Firstly, the past, very quickly, then update the present, and finally the future. And as in the first lecture I gave us today, uh, I use a couple of doctor's letters because that's what we, we have as our daily bread. So it was 30 years ago, we uh, described the antiphospholipid syndrome, and uh, the paper that we, we published the method in was The Lancet. And uh, you all know The Lancet is, is a difficult journal. It's very hard to get papers accepted. In fact, they used to be very famous for their rejection letters. I don't know if any of you have had rejection letters from The Lancet, but uh, dear Dr. Hughes, it breaks my heart to turn down <laughs> such a wonderfully written, it, you, you know, the Anyway, we, we have a collection of those. But this took a long time. It was nearly a year, and it finally was published. It was very exciting for us. I, I, I remember the day in our unit, we all went for a, a Chinese, uh, sorry, an Italian meal at lunchtime at a local bad health, health uh, food place. So what's the background to the syndrome? Just very quickly. Uh, again, William Osler probably got there first. He described a male with lupus who had a stroke. And I, I, I would guess he had antiphospholipid antibodies, and stroke is one of the major features. But over the years, many people wrote case reports of lupus having various clotting problems. And I put this one in because it was one of my junior fellows, Rick Travers, who many of you may know lives here in, in Melbourne as a physician. He, uh, we described a, a case of a girl with lupus, put on the oral contraceptive, and got a DVT, well known over the years in lupus. But she also had a false positive Wasserman reaction. And there are several cases in lupus going back like this. And in 1975, when I was back at the Hammersmith Hospital in London, I was, as I've told you in the earlier talk, posted to Jamaica. And one of the interesting things there, apart from the huge numbers of lupus patients, we became interested in um, a disease called Jamaican neuropathy. Now, this is... Um, an acute transverse myelitis. These women end up in wheelchairs with paraplegia. And they're interesting because they have a false positive VDRL and they're ANA positive. And we were interested in Hammersmith in those days in a disease called lupoid sclerosis. It's kind of half and half between lupus and MS. Some of you may know this. And we wondered whether the false positive VDRL was, was basically an antibody that was reacting with neuronal phospholipids, and that might be the reason for the paralysis. It's now known to be a viral disease, but this might be the pathogenesis. And probably not the case, but it led us to start setting up assays for antibodies to phospholipids. And a few years later, this slide I showed earlier was the so-called Hebberden Round. Now, in those days, the British Society of Rheumatology used to have an annual meeting, and one person would present his or her uh, medical interest. And in those days, it was with patients, and these were all uh, women who actually came along to the meeting. And three of these patients uh, had 
the anti, what we call then the anticardiolipin syndrome. The tall girl, third from the right at the end, looking rather Cushingoid, had bilateral renal vein thrombosis and as her manifestation. It was not lupus nephritis, it was thrombosis. A, a girl, second there with a spotted dress on the left, had severe migraine and thrombocytopenia, uh, and a third girl had had n a numerous DVTs. And we presented this for the first time in public as a possible subset of lupus patients. And this is just to recap what we described, that this was arterial, not just venous, that this was a brain disease, including chorea, stroke, that levido was a prominent feature of these patients, occasionally low patents, but the big thing for us was this looked as if it was distinct from lupus. This was our team at the time. Uh, the top right is Dr. Mackworth Young, who uh, your chairman has, has, has spent time with, and, and this is the group of of our team at the Hammersmith Hospital. On my left is Aziz Garavi, who was a genius. He, he, um, he came from Iran uh, as a, something of a refugee, and having never touched a test tube, he became the really the most wonderful research worker in the lab. He also brewed the beer in our laboratory. <laughs> And the whole lab smelt of, of hops the whole time. He was strict Muslim, and his wife didn't know about that side of things. A year later, we decided we'd hold the first World Symposium. And I'll never forget this, because I got my secretary to get the names, and we had people queuing in four groups, A to D, E to F, you know, all that sort of thing. And I think there were 48 attendees. And this was the world first symposium on antiphospholipids. And we moved to St. Thomas's in 85, and this was the second. And since then, there have been congresses every second year. And I mentioned earlier the international one. Most recently, there were 600 or so people. So although we all say that many doctors in our old fields like rheumatology or neurology don't know about it, there is increasing recognition. The fourth, was it the fourth of these international symposium was back in Jamaica, run by Nigel Harris, and this was, of course, a very memorable sort of meeting. These are some of the people who have worked in the field, and um, th they are all friends. It's a very sort of small group. Um, in the middle at the top is Dr. Muntha Kamashta, who is my right-hand man at St. Thomas's. Um, we call him Jesus, actually, because he was born in Bethlehem. He's a Christian Arab and uh, a, a lovely man. And the woman on the top right-hand corner, Sylvia, um, sadly died of cancer a few months ago. So it was very uh, mixed, uh, but very international. French in the bottom right, Sylvia, uh, uh, Angela Tincani in the center from Italy, uh, Nigel Harris from Jamaica, uh, Dutch, uh, Ron Asherson, who was originally from South Africa, all involved in this research. And this is Garavi in the lab. You can see how, um, how important the beer making was in the background. If I've got time, I must tell you a wonderful story about Dr. Garavi. Um, he had been with us a few months on some sort of temporary visa, and he wasn't sure whether he was legal or illegal as an immigrant to the United Kingdom. And we were working on, on antibodies, and we had to get thymuses. And, um, he discovered that there's an abattoir near our hospital that, that didn't want thymuses, that they got rid of them. So he volunteered to collect them. So for some reason, he, he and his wife went in their deux chevaux to this abattoir, and they were given a bin, a full plastic bin full of thymuses and blood. And they drove out of the abattoir into a head-on collision. <laughs> and, as is, who wasn't sure whether he was a legal immigrant, uh, was, was so upset by this, he, we never talked about it again. <laughs> so the, the past, what about the present? Well, this is from the last international meeting held fairly recently in Rio. And this is a study from largely American group, but international. Um, literature review, and this is the sort of figures that 
I think are now being quoted. Um, if you take recurrent pregnancy loss, 12% of all cases. If you take strokes, 14%. If it's young strokes, 25%. Young heart attacks, women, I'll show you in a minute uh, data. If you unexpected heart attack in a 40-year-old woman, think antiphospholipid. DVT all over 10% or in most series now over that. So it's a common disorder actually out there in internal medicine. No mention here of, of psychiatry. So thrombosis, yes. Uh, uh, venous thrombosis like some of the other factor 5 Leiden and other diseases, but also arterial thrombosis. Now what's happened since is, as I mentioned, the science has moved on. We know that the antibodies are directed not specifically against phospholipids, but against phospholipid binding proteins. One of them is prothrombin, but the most famous one is this beta-2 GP1. And this beta-2 is, this is the molecule, this slide given to me by Takeo Koike from Japan. And it's, um, we know that the antibodies are directed to structural components of this molecule. Beta-2 is quite an interesting molecule, actually. It's one nice way of remembering it is it's a natural vacuum cleaner. It gets rid of cellular debris. Um, it's obviously a very important molecule in the body. And uh, natural antibodies to beta-2 regulate its functional activity. So something of what you've been hearing uh, earlier today. And this is moving right forward now to modern treatment, not just warfarin and so on, but possible uh, anti-biologics, antibodies to some of the bad guys in this disease. For instance, the P38 MAP kinase signaling pathway plays an important role in antiphospholipid-induced tissue factor expression on monocytes. And this is where we're at at the moment, to see whether these, in fact, affect the clotting mechanism in this disease.